Yeah, welcome everybody. The uh, oh, yeah. Kitzah Shulchan Aruch, the abridged code mm -hmm. of Jewish law, chapter nineteen, and we're up to number ten. Sif Yud. Okay, so we're we're speaking about in the Shmon Esra and the Amida, the uh, on certain occasions <coughs> there's additions. So last time we finished off discussing the prayer for rain. It's not an addition per se, but it, it changes at the, at the different seasons. But uh, the next few are additions. So uh, Yud number 10. We're going to discuss Yalda Vyavoy. So Yalda Vyavoy is uh, added in on Rosh Chodesh and uh, intermediate days of festivals. So uh, with an actual festival day, we have a whole different I mean, a whole different Shimon Esrei. But um, in the intermediate days, we add Yalav Yavoy. And the Yalav Yavoy describes, well, I'll say describes, but it requests that ideally we should, we should rebuild the base of Mikdash, we should have all, be able to bring the offerings again and various things. And in it, we make mention of the day. So whether it's Rosh Chodesh, like we had the last two days, the beginning of the Jewish month, or one of the festivals, etc. So what happens if a person forgets? So there's going to be differences if they forget between Rosh Chodesh and, and the intermediate day of a festival. But let's first talk about Rosh, about Rosh Chodesh. Shachach Yalda V'yavoy the person he forgot to say, she forgot to say Yalav Yavli. When do they forget? Rosh Chodesh, B'Shachris on B'Mincha, or Rosh Chodesh on the new month, at either the morning or afternoon service. Notice we're leaving out the evening service here. So on Rosh Chodesh, it's only the morning or afternoon. B'Chol but an intermediate day of a festival. Is that someone in? On the intermediate day of a festival, Bain Bashachris, Bain Bemincha, Bain Bamariv. Now there's no difference whether it's the morning, afternoon, or evening service. So the laws we're going to apply here apply to everything except for the evening service of Rosh Chodesh. What does he do? In this Kaidem Shama Yudrotsoin, if they remember. Before they say the Yeratzoin, the conclusion, saying, may our prayers be accepted, which is at the, the end, then Chayza Maschil Ratzay. He goes back to Ratzay, goes back to the section, beginning of the section that contains Yalav Yavoy. Vafilo in this Gokoyim Shiskel Moidim. Even the person remembers before they started Moidim. Kivan Shasayim. Since they already completed the blessing of that we re the Shekhinah should return to Zion, they have to go back to Ritzay, beginning of that section. Ah, however, if so if if a person remembers before he says the blessing, so he says it where he is, where he's up to, and he starts the sentence. Now, if a person only remembers after they said the yirotzoin, the conclusion part of the shmonesrei. They now have to go back to the beginning of the Shemesr. Now, Rosh Chodesh and the evening prayer, if I forgot then, whether Rosh Chodesh is one day or two days irrelevant, as soon as he has started the bracha of Hamachzish as soon as he says Hashem's name, Shuv he does not return, does not go back. 
Rather, he completes the blessing and then completes his prayer and goes on. Now, why is Mariv different on Rosh Chodesh to everything else? But Tambaze, and the reason for this is, they didn't actually sanctify or make the new month at night. Right, so what used to happen, there used to be witnesses. They would see the new moon and they would come to the Sanhedrin. Um, ideally, the Sanhedrin was in the base of Mikdash, but we know uh, during Roman times, uh, the, the, the Sanhedrin was in exile in various places around Israel, the most famous being the city of Yavna. But um, wherever the Sanhedrin is, so again, in the ideal world, they had a chamber on the Temple Mount, and they would go there and they would give their testimony that they saw the new moon. And they would ask them various questions to make sure that they had really seen it and not just imagining it or whatever. And then they declared, the Sanhedrin declared the new moon. Now, they would never declare the new moon at night. They only ever declared it during the day. So the witnesses obviously saw it at night. But let's say they saw it early in the evening and they lived close to Yushalayim and they traveled there quickly. And so they got there while it's still night. The Sanhedrin did not see them, did not interview them until it became day. And only in the daytime did they declare the new month. So therefore, if a person forgot to praise the new month in the evening prayer, since it anyway was not yet uh, decreed or declared, um, so after the fact, we don't repeat. So just going to give a, a bit of a background on, on the new moon since we mentioned it on Rosh Chodesh. So today we have a set calendar. So uh, we went through a few different um, periods before we got to the set calendar we have today. So let's let's start back at, at the beginning. And so hopefully it'll be clear for everyone. And any of course, any questions? Please don't hesitate to ask. So, excuse me. The again, the ideal situation is as follows: the Sanhedrin will be in the chamber in the in the on the Temple Mount, and someone who sees the moon. So, what happens is that, uh, of course, the moon stays the same size, but the, relative to the angle of the moon to the Earth, it appears as if it's shrinking. And it appears as if it if it disappears. Um, once it disappears from sight, then the next night it it, it returns, a, a small slither, and then it starts to grow, and then the middle of the month, fifteenth of the month usually, is the full moon. So when someone sees, there's meant to be witnesses that they see the the rebirth of the moon, so to speak. And they would go to the Sanhedrin and they would give their testimony and the um, if they accepted it, they declared that day Rosh Chodesh. And then what they did for hundreds of years is they would have these uh, big bonfires ready to go on mountaintops. Israel is a very mountainous country, if you've been there. And uh, what they would do is on the first mountain they would light these big torches from the bonfire and they would wave them backwards and forwards and then the people on the next mountain uh, saw that and they would light theirs and within a few hours it not only had the message not only been spread to the entire israel but even in the second temple period when there were jews in babylon and and, and other places they all knew the next night everyone knew the next night <clears throat> so uh, that was didn't have WhatsApp or email to be able to let everyone know instantly, but it didn't take too long, a few hours. Unfortunately, there were uh, people who had an agenda. Um, you know, it's the uh, uh, I guess the Reform Judaism of that time, whatever it was, that they wanted to make festivals on different days. And they would send people up and they would, they killed the person 
um, uh, manning the bonfires and they would start setting up, setting them off on the wrong night to be able to get their, uh, to twist the calendar to their, their schemes. So they started having, instead, they would send messages on horseback. Um, now, when this happened, they were not able to reach beyond the border of Israel um, in time for the festivals. Uh, so therefore, um, people didn't know, see, Rosh Chodesh could be one of two days. So the Jews in Babylon didn't know was Rosh Chodesh today or tomorrow. And it took more than two weeks for the messages to get there. So Pesach, Sukkot, all these days, all these festivals had started. And this is the origin of having two days of Yantav. Because if Rosh Chodesh was the earlier day, then this is the first day of Pesach. Rosh Chodesh is the next day. Then what we call second day Yantav is the correct day based on where Rosh Chodesh was. The other issue they had, and this was in the middle of this development, was the another group would send witnesses, false witnesses, to say they saw the moon when they didn't send. So originally, they would accept the testimony from any Jew, because uh, any Jew, why, should, why, why shouldn't they be trustworthy? They're very excited to do the mitzvah. And then unfortunately, when these false witnesses started to come, the Sanhedrin could only accept testimony from people that they knew. Now, there's a limit to how many people throughout the entire country of Israel that they knew. So what used to happen? So let's say, uh, you know, we um, we saw, you know, let's say us as a group, we saw the moon in wherever we happened to live in Israel, right? And the Sanhedrin didn't know us. But they knew Rabbi Smith, even though he wasn't one of the ones who saw it. So what what would happen is the witnesses would go, and Rabbi Smith would go with them. And he would testify the Sanhedrin that these are trustworthy people. And then they could accept the testimony from people that they didn't know. So uh, you ended up having groups. And the uh, these groups, particularly during Roman times, uh, sometimes uh, it wasn't always safe to travel. And even on Shabbos, they could travel. If they need be, they could carry weapons and, and various things. It was, uh, it was quite complicated at a certain point. So there were less smooth times, as, as we see, and there were more smooth times, Baruch Hashem, for the majority of the time. But then a new issue came up. A new issue came up is that to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to have a certain type of ordination. Now, this ordination died out. Why? What, what made it die out? You could only receive it in the land of Israel. And you could only receive it from someone who had it. So you had to have a teacher who had this this ordination, this smicha, with a student who deserved it in the land of Israel. And due to the terrible uh, persecutions, we'll, we'll loosely call it um, Roman, but it was Byzantine, right? It was the, you know, the Roman emperor, empire split into two. It, life became so bad for the Jews in Israel and the study of Tyre was banned, penalty of death, and it was, it was such a terrible time that essentially all the yeshivas in Israel closed. All the major yeshivas, anyway. I'm sure there was some underground something somewhere. And pretty much all the scholars moved to Babylon, which is why we end up having the, the Babylon, Babylonian Talmud being so um, much the primary work of Judaism because. Was, is the uh, as we mentioned last week the they called Talmud Shalmi, but it wasn't really um, in Jerusalem. It was up north in the Galil, is where they uh, 
it, it developed. It stopped prematurely because the yeshiva's closed. And they moved to uh, moved to Babylon. And all those scholars and their students, together with those who are already in Babylon, continued the development of the Babylonian Talmud for another um, few hundred years. So um, that's why it's the Babylonian Talmud that, that is, uh, has the primacy. So uh, when this, as this was happening, there was a head of the Sanhedrin called Hillel. Now, not the famous Hillel, but he was a descendant. Right, Hillel's family was actually head of the Sanhedrin for 14 generations. But one of, uh, he was actually Hillel the fourth, or possibly fifth. Uh, yeah. I think the fifth, actually. So he was, what what he did with, he saw, they saw the Sanhedrin was going to come to an end because they didn't have the, the ability to develop students in Israel worthy of uh, being able to receive this ordination. They just weren't there. The people weren't there. The teachers weren't there. The students weren't there. And so the Sanhedrin was going to come to an end. And so he set up a system, a 19-year cycle, uh, which has very sleepy years. Um, and this 19-year cycle repeats itself. Uh, and this essentially is the calendar we have till till today. We have this uh, 19th cycle that keeps going. And that's how we have uh, Rosh Chodesh today. It's it's not clear whether they they actually um, declared every single Rosh Chodesh, perhaps through Rosh Chodesh, a sort of prophecy with when Mashiach's going to come and they actually declared everyone, or they just declared the, the, the system. It's not so clear. But whatever happened... That is why we have a set calendar today, and we, we we're having Rosh Chodesh even without witnesses. Um, that's that's it. But nevertheless, when they did say it, when they did declare the Rosh Chodesh, they didn't do it at night, and that's why after the fact, the someone forgot Yalav Yavoi at Marav in the evening service, they don't have to repeat the um, the Shemun Esrei. All right, Yud Aleph, number 11. Shachach Rosh Chodesh B'chol HaMoyed, Yalav Yom B'Shachos. Now, someone forgot in the morning service. Rosh Chodesh, Chol HaMoyed, doesn't make a difference. They forgot in the morning service to say Yalav Yom Now, they're meant to go back. But they forgot so much. Um... Even though they don't remember until after they davened Musaf, which this is so they've already mentioned, they've already mentioned in the Musaf Rosh Chodesh or Cholmoid. Become mockim, nevertheless. So lacks this palm shakus. They should go back. And say the chakras again. Vim avazmana, but if the time went like it's it's midday already, so you can't say uh, the the morning service anymore. The men would fill us mincha. Then they should make it up at mincha. They should do the mincha twice, as we learned earlier. Someone forgot the uh, the uh, mid that they can make up at the next at the next um, the next prayer. Okay, so someone forgot, he realizes afterwards, or he's doing now two minchas, whatever he's doing. Number 12, any situation where a person has to daven all over again. So he finishes one Shemun Esrei, one Amidah. The person has to pause the time will take to walk for Amos approximately six feet before they start the next one. Shouldn't just go straight into it without a pause. Should be a small pause. Okay, so that's regular people. What about the Chazan? The Chazan forgets. So, number 13. Shliach Sibba Shetabat Filas Lachash. 
So now we're speaking about the Chazan, the one leading the service. He forgot in his own personal Shemunasra. So the way it works is he says his own personal Shemunasra together with the, with the congregation. And then there's a Chazan's repetition afterwards. So in his own personal one, he forgot. He doesn't have to do his own one a second time. Why? If Because he's going to be bothering the congregation. He's going to keep everyone waiting till he finishes the second one. So what does he do instead? The repetition that he says aloud, he has in mind, he does that as his own personal Shemun Esrei as well. Right, and then in brackets, we mentioned, therefore, after the repetition, he he takes, he says the last paragraph is normally not said in the repetition. Normally on a personal Shemunesra, he says it also. He says it quietly, but he says it. Okay. That's if, that's if he made that mistake. But if he made a mistake in the first three blessings, so not Yalava Yalava, Yalava Yalava is a, you know, two thirds in, the full rush But he made it. Let's say the Mashiach or Merigeshim or something. One of the prayer for for rain that we mentioned the last week that he has to go back. If he made a mistake in one of the first three blessings that causes him to go back to the beginning, then remembers early enough that it won't cause a big delay to the congregation have to wait for him. Then Yachso, then he does do his own private. Um, re, you know, says it again privately before the um, repetition. Okay. Now, the next addition that's added in is on a communal fast day. On fast days, we add a certain prayer. <clears throat> Potentially more than one, depends which fast day. So we're going to discuss that in number 14. you dalit. Beyom Hatinus on a fast day. Bain Batinus Sibyl Bain Batinus Yochid. Now this applies on a communal fast day when everyone's going to say it, or even a private fast day. If a person accepts fasts upon himself, whatever reason, we don't recommend that, but if they happen to do, then it applies to him personally, not to anyone else. Oyimrim Batfilasamincha, then in the afternoon prayer, Birchas Shmakalainu. In the blessing of Shema Kalena, which speaks about general, a general prayer is being accepted, we add in a tefillah called Anainu. Anainu means literally answer us. And as a prayer, please answer us for our the the troubles we're going through, the issues that we're, whatever we're fasting for. So we ask Hashem that our prayers should be answered. Shmegia lebechol eis sarovetsuka, and when it, if it happens, if we come to any so when we reach the words, the whole a sarovat sukkah, which means that any uh, trouble or problem, yisayim ki Then we go back to the the standard text of the blessing. So in other words, we start the shema kaleinu, and then we put the anenu prayer in it, and then we finish the blessing of shema kaleinu. Now the im shachach maloim anenu. So that's what Mitz said. So what if someone forgot? If we, a person only remembered once they said Hashem's name, they said Baruch Ato Hashem, to say Shemet Tefillah, to conclude the blessing, we, we, we don't go back. So what do they do instead? Rather, once they finish the entire Shemun Esrei, before we take the three steps back, we say it then, and we conclude that you the should please accept our 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 tefillas, our prayers, and take the three steps back, and that's how we finish. But if we don't, if he doesn't remember till after he finished the whole shemun esrei, that's it. It's gone. We don't go back. Um, it would have been nice, but 
essentially we never have to repeat. We never have to repeat for omitting the anenu. So that's that's the additions. Questions? Questions? No. no. <coughs> okay. So we'll start a new chapter then. Chapter twenty. So the Chazan's repetition. So again, um, let's just do some background history. How do we end up with the Chazan's repetition? So when the men of the Great Assembly, when they rebuilt the Second Base of Mikdosh, introduced, introduced that we should um, introduce the Siddur, we should have the text of the Davening we have today. We have to remember, of course, it was pre-printing press and uh, handwritten, uh, you know, for everyone to have a sitter would mean millions of handwritten copies. So what used to happen is people used to daven by heart. People would learn the davening off by heart and uh, they would just pray from memory. Unfortunately, many people are not able to learn the entire Siddha off by heart. Anyone here volunteering for it? No? So, uh, you had some people who weren't able to daven. <clears throat> so what happened is they introduced a Chazan's repetition of the middah of the Shemun Esra, of the main part of the service. And after saying their own Shemun Esra, the Chazan would say it again, all off by heart. He would repeat it. And he would have in mind that he's saying it for the people who weren't able to daven themselves. Similarly, often you have a whole group together for Kiddush. One person might say the Kiddush and everyone else is listening. And they're fulfilling their requirement by listening. So these people are fulfilling their requirement of the Shemun Esrei by listening. And so they will listen to every single word um, and fulfill their obligation that way. So even though today, Baruch Hashem, we have printed Tzadurim, you know, everyone can have their own sinner, and with translations and with everything, and so we're all um, doing our own davening, but still, um, we still have the repetition. You never know, you never know when someone needs, uh, someone needs it said for them. So that's that's how it came about. So Simon Chof, chapter 20, Din Chazar Stephilus HaShlech HaTzibah, the laws of the repetition. The Chazan's repetition. Okay, Aleph number one. When the Chazan steps back his three steps at the end of his own quiet, private Shimon Esrei, he stays in his place. The time it would take to walk for Amos approximately six feet. You know, a few seconds. It takes to take a few steps, four steps. And then he returns to his place. And he starts saying, now here's a presumption that everyone else is finished. And therefore he's going to start the repetition as soon as he's finished. It's not always the case. So uh, what we should add in here for practicality, this works very, this is theoretically how it works. But in practicality what happens is then you look around and see if the congregation has finished. Maybe I dumb faster than everyone else, you know, and uh, and if I'm going to start repetition, there's going to be no one answering because they're all going to be uh, still davening. So we'll look around and we see we have the majority or the amount of people that we need. So then he, he whispers, Hashem Safasai Tiftach B'chulu B'goyimah. Right, so that's the, we mentioned this a few weeks ago, the pre-prayer where we ask Hashem to uh, um Open our mouth so we can daven properly, and then after that, maschil b'kol. Then we begin saying aloud. Begin saying aloud, baruch ato b'chul, etc. Starts repeating aloud. The chol echad yizar lishtoik as the shema hetiv. Everyone else has to be careful to be quiet and to listen well. The kavin the mashu oimer, and they should be following, paying attention to what he's saying. 
right? So you know, if you if you're used to davening every day, through, you know, with a, with a minion, and uh, you hear it day after day, you can follow it pretty well just by listening. But there are, there, there are many people who follow along pointing in the sitter, you know, as, as whatever it is, meant to pay attention. And every time we hear a bracha, that the chasen says, Baruch atah Hashem, we should say Baruch HaRukshamoy, as we learned about in the earlier chapters. And when the chasen completes the bracha, we say, Amen. But feel a little might. Even if a person's learning, they weren't part of the minion. They're sitting in the shul learning. Person shouldn't be learning during the repetition. Right? They should pay attention. Now, if you're not allowed to study Torah during the repetition, you have to pay attention. And needless to say, you don't sit and have a chat. During the repetition, right? And someone who's uh, you should consider it this is if it's not too difficult, but someone who should consider it as if you're davening your own personal Shimon Esri. So, how would you daven your own Shimon Esri? Either with closed eyes or Lira's Tachasido or following inside the Siddam, Masha Oymash Lech Sibyl, what the Chazan is saying. So that you don't have to do, but it's a good thing to do. If you've uh, if you've ever seen um, videos over the Bible, there's uh, this um, during the Chazan's Re- repetition, uh, you see he sits in his place with the sitter, and he sits there with his like hand like like this, so he's not distracted, with his eyes looking to the sitter, following along every word. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure he knew it off by heart. And he could follow without doing so, but that's uh, that's an example. Now there there are those who, after the kedusha, so in the middle of the first three blessings in the repetition, not in the private shemana, so on the repetition, we have a section called kedusha. Well, we um, we we mentioned how the 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 angels, for like a better translation, uh, they recognize only Hashem is in this world. The certain praise of Hashem, and also the Jewish people, because Hashem is here with us, and we answer. So the people who after after the answering, cholzin tefillah shel Rashi and menichem tefillah zavanu the rabbanu tam, they t- those who wear two pairs of tefillin, sometimes at that point they take off the first pair. And during the repetition, they put on the second pair. And he says um, that this is not correct. Okay. There are communities that do that. So I'm not sure what their source is, but that's... Uh, Rabbi? That's, yeah. Let's backtrack a little bit. In the Sidur, uh, for the weekly minister, uh, it says, you know, there's two... Pay- after um, Ra'e, ra- uh, you have the Chazan recites the Anenu, okay? But then a few pages later, uh, for af- after Ratse, it's also repeated Anenu again. Is this Does it have to be done if the Chazan does it? I mean, no, the, the Chazan says Anenu in one spot earlier, and we say Anenu, everyone else, an individual says in Shema Kaleinu. I see. So this can be done for a pu- public fast as well as a person. Yeah, so so two things. Um, so we're going to mention this because later on in the, because we're doing the laws of um, the Chazan's repetition. The last chapter was just our personal Shemun Esrei. So now personal Shemun Esrei, we only say a Nainu at Mincha, uh, not a Shachris, and we only say it um, in the Shema Kaleinu. Which is just before the modem, so I guess that's why maybe you said they have is printed afterwards, like at the bottom of the page or something, but it goes in that spot. Um, in the Khan's repetition, it said earlier uh, as its own blessing. Um, that's that's only relevant to the Khazan. So, the, but the individual only says it 
only at Mincha and only at Shmuel Kalina. Yes, Thank you. Okay. All right. And, uh, okay, base, number two. Now, at this repetition that the Chazan is doing, Kevin Shashliach Palo Even though he's already davened his own personal, since he's already davened his own personal, Shimon Esrei quietly, he's only repeating it for those who are listening. Because he's already done Shimon Esrei. So the chain therefore, we need to have at least nine people listening and answering. Answering. It's not just enough that the minion is present. There has to be nine people who are actually answering, listening, following along, and answering. In order that his blessings should not be in vain, because if he's uh, if there's no one, since it's for the listeners. For the congregation, if there's not a congregation listening, then uh, he's saying it for nothing, and therefore we end up saying Hashem's name for no reason. The chain, and therefore minion When you have an exact minion or a, almost exact, the chazan has to be careful. He can't start his repetition. Until everyone's finished, because there's only exactly ten people, and they can't answer while they're doing their own chumash. Right, so you have to wait till everyone's finished. If you're in a very large shul, you know there's uh, you know, twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred people there. You don't have to wait till everyone's finished. Okay. Gimel number three. The next thing the chazan has to be concerned about is. When the chazan finishes one blessing, before he starts the next blessing, he has to wait enough time for everyone to say Amen. Right? He has to give them a chance to say Amen before he starts the next blessing, otherwise they can't be listening to him. Well, they're saying, Amen. Vim hiskel, take a brocha, Keres. If he starts next brocha immediately, could go in, for example, Shasayim Mogin Avram hiskel miyad at the gibber. Right, finishes the blessing of Mogin Avram, and then he starts straight away the next word at the gibber. As Kivan, as I Kivan Shiskel Loima at the gibber, Shov ain't Omen Amen. Once he starts the next blessing, People can't say Amen anymore. When the Shmita Amen, I saw love. And then the responsibility, I guess we'll say the penalty, punishment, but the responsibility for the lack of the Amen falls on him. So the Chazan always has to make sure to pause the people can say Baruch Shemoy and to be able to say Amen, to give a pause there. Now we mentioned the Kedusha. Right? There's Kaddish, 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 and Tzvok, right? So we have this kedusha that we that we answer to in the in the um, repetition. So David, we're going to discuss the kedusha now. The kedusha, while the kedusha is happening, Yisrael called Echad the Kavan Ragulov Shushteim Bayachad Kilohaya Regal Achas. Every one in the congregation stands up with their feet together, so it's like they have one leg, so to speak. Same like in Shemot Esrei. And when we say the words holy, 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 and also with the words Baruch in the next response, and the word Yimloich in the third response, we loosely translate a bounce on our tippy toes. We go up on our tippy toes. We lift our body up and our ankle off the heel off the ground. Nahagim, this are Nayim la Morim, and it's good the custom to look upwards. For Taif Shtieno Sugurais, and it's preferable the eyes be closed. Now, some people can't do this and need to look in their sitter to read the words to respond, and that's fine. But uh, if a person knows it up by heart, then they can do it like that. 
Okay. So then we start going through all the blessings. The Chazan saying all the blessings. We're saying Baruch Hu Shemoi. We're saying Amen. And we come to the last three blessings. We come to the Moedim. So number hey, third last blessing. When the Chazan reaches Moedim, this is when we, we acknowledge Hashem as our king. Mishtachvim kolakal. Then what happens is all the congregation bows. For and they say Moedim the Rabbanu kol mishtachavaya. So in 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 the Moedim in the Shemona Esrei, there's the actual Moedim of um of the Shemona Esrei. It's a, it's a paragraph where we we acknowledge Hashem as our King and now. Holds our soul, and uh, we can't Shem's greatness, and we can't describe. There's various things that we say, and that's what we say in our own personal Shem Esrei, and that's what the Chazan says in his repetition. However, when the Chazan says that in the repetition, we say another version um, of the Moedim. It's called Moedim the Rabbonin, because various rabbis of a time in the Talmudic times added another phrase or two, and we say this while bowing slightly. So we say that at the same time. It's interesting, it's interesting, um, without getting too sidetracked, uh, the entire Shemun Esrei, the Chazan can fulfill our obligation, if need be. The, and all we say is, Amen, Baruch Hashemai, Amen. The only thing we have to say ourselves is the Moedim. And why is that? So the Moedim is, on the one hand, acknowledging that Hashem is the king. But on the other hand, it's also thanking, thanking Hashem. And the reason that no one can thank Hashem for us, we have to thank Hashem for ourselves, is because no one can thank Hashem like you can thank Hashem. Meaning, every one of us has total different life experiences. We have, Hashem's given us different blessings you know, my family is not your family and your family is not someone else's family. And whatever we've had in life, all the wonderful things that Hashem gives us, because each one of us, what Hashem has given us is unique, therefore, the thanks that we give to Hashem for that is also unique. And so no one can thank Hashem for, our, for, for your life, only you can. No one can thank Hashem for my life, only I can. And uh, that's why we, we all have to say our own moidim. The rest, the chazan can say for us, if need be. But the moidim, we have to say that ourselves. Only we can thank Hashem. Every one of us is unique. Rabbi? Yeah. The moidim is almost, it has the same effect, I would assume, as the Shema. It, it's, you know, because you're, uh, you know, it almost seems that it has the same effect in some way it's it's equal and you know and it's uh and it's and it's strength you know you know i mean it, i know that the shema is, the, i we're you know we in terms of pre predilection would you say the modim is has more impact than the shema i mean well the, the, of... there are definitely similarities um the shema is one of the 613 mitzvahs so it has a certain uh, greatness that no other part of davening has, and because we're saying the specific words that Shem told us to say, it also has a certain something that no other part has. Having said that, yet yeah, the Moedim does have some similar <coughs> themes, and so there is a connection. But I'll point out like this every one of us, our souls have different sources, and therefore, there's gonna be certain parts of davening that speak to us more than other parts. So if if the modem is 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 speaking to you, is tugging at your soul more than, than other parts of davening, then that's something you should put all your heart and soul into. And someone else might find a different part of davening that tugs at their soul. Yeah, Mordechai. Yes, so when the yeah you know, when the chazan is saying modi uh, emotions. The Chazan left there saying, "Madim not not new law, 
uh, not say it out loud at all until the end or uh, do it in a you know, slightly lower tone uh, than the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when I work at uh, the uh, in-person seniors call that I go to, which is in Rabbi Nimi Swartik Shul, uh, when I uh, when I occasionally serve as Shalasi, were there, uh, they uh, and they pointed out uh, that I should be saying it in an undertone, but not completely silent. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's a hands repetition, so the community needs to hear. So, in theory, we don't do this, but I'm saying in theory, you should probably say it louder because because uh, people are saying other things. So, if everyone wants to hear, you have to say it louder. Uh, in practice, what happens is everyone's saying their own thing, so it's advantage of the hands to have a bit of a break. That's the right way to put it. Uh, that's that's really, I, I believe, how, how, it, how it began. Um, so personally, I just keep going. Same, the same, uh, same loudness. <clears throat> but, um, seems to develop it correct in most places that they say it quieter. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that's correct. But I wasn't going to mention it because I, I something that's become spread amongst uh, pretty much all the Jewish people is not my place to uh, to to criticize. So the Chazan says his moedim. We say the words moedim and nafalach. We we gratefully acknowledge acknowledgement to you. We say with the Chazan. Then he continues his wording. We continue our wording, and we're bowed slightly. Now. Misha Oymed with Philishman Esrei. Shemesh Vashemesh Ashlech Siba Gila Moidim. You have someone. He came a little bit late, or he davened slower, and he's still in his own Shemon Esrei, and he hears the Chazan coming to Moidim. Now, Im who Oymed with Emsa Brocha, if he's in the middle of a blessing, Shtachave Gam Kain, he also gives a little bow. So it doesn't look like uh, he's separating himself, that he's bowing, not bowing when everyone else is to Hashem. But if he's at the beginning or the end of a blessing, he shouldn't bow. Why not? Because we have like this. The four places that we bow in our private Shemun Esrei, they're all either at the beginning or the end of a bracha, of a blessing. And these were specifically instituted by our sages. And we're not allowed to add to this. We can't have extra bowings at the beginning or the end of blessings. Only those four. In the middle of blessing, now is no problem. Okay. Vav number six. Kaidem sha'aymashnech siba sim shalom. Before the Chazan starts the last blessing of Sim Shalom, we ask for peace in the world and for the people of Israel. Oyeme says of the Kenvig of Asena Baruchena Vachulu, he says the priestly blessing. He says the introduction and he says the priestly blessing. Sha'oyeme Vishmerecho, and when he finishes the each line of the blessing, so the first one is Shmerecha. Um, Makal, Ken He Rotsoin. He says they should say Ken He Rotsoin, so it should be Hashem's name. Below Yomer Amen, they shouldn't say Amen. In many other congregations, they say Amen. So reality is, it doesn't matter which one you say, Amen or Ken He Rotsoin. But what you shouldn't do is say both. And because there are some places that do that, that say Amen, Ken He Rotsoin. But that's. Uh, you, you're saying the same thing twice. Can show him the 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 same conclusion because the priestly blessing has three mini blessings. So uh, at the last word, after the last word of the second one and the and the third one, and that's what we do. 
Now we only do this at Chakras and Musaf. In other words, in the morning. Not in the afternoon. Right? Okay. The reason for this is that the, the the priests are not allowed to bless if they've drunk uh, a revius, you know, a small cup of, of wine, of alcohol. And, uh, you know, people, I mean, still people today have a glass of wine or a beer or something with their, with their lunch or something. But back in the day, don't forget, you know, water wasn't clean. Um, you know, so people, wine was the primary drink. You know, cause you, and you also didn't have refrigeration to keep other juices and different things. So you made wine and that, that was what people drank. So at Mencha, they wouldn't, in the afternoon service, they weren't technically able to uh, to to give the blessing. So at Mencha, we don't say it. Rak batana sibo, except on a fast day. Because on a fast day, uh, we're not drinking. Uh, and certainly not wine. Sh'armi gamba mencha, sim shalom. We'll also say sim shalom. Az oime shlech sibo. Gamma the can we can say no, so we say it all. The ain oimrim oisa base of it. Someone say something? Yeah, Ezra. You're you're saying that the Amen and Kenya Yatsona are both the same thing, yet they mean two different things. One means it's true, the Amen, and the other one, Kenya Yatsona, may be as well. So, so Amen means both. both. Amen has both those meanings. That should be, it's true, I agree. And then you have certain blessings that are on the future. A future tense, and in that context, Amen means, and so it should be. So Shem should this happen. So Amen, Amen has both meanings in it. Okay, we don't say the priestly blessings in a in the house of a mourner. Nor do we say it at Tisha uh in the morning, right? Because. Uh, Police blessing is in is in a, in a in a time of sadness that it, it doesn't belong there. Um, just as a side point. Excuse me, Rabbi. Yeah. I I'm confused. You were talking about davening. Is do women div, daven a differently than men? Because uh, I've heard some women when I went to temple say they already did their davening. Is it different from men? Different breath. Blessings or different order or anything? So generally speaking, it's the same. There's a few minor differences. One, one. The, I guess the primary difference, uh, well, the most one of the most obvious differences, which unfortunately is often twisted or misunderstood in today's world. So we have three blessings where we thank Hashem for the mitzvahs. Now, if we just thanked Hashem, if we just said thank you for the mitzvahs you've given me, We'd only get one blessing. So we divide it into three. First thing is we thank Hashem that uh, that we're Jewish. So because non-Jews have seven mitzvahs, and Jews have 613 mitzvahs. So we ask for that. Then we thank Hashem that we're not an Eved. You know, many, many places can translate the word Eved as a slave. It definitely doesn't mean, we're not talking about a, a it's definitely not what we call a slave in the Western world. An Eved means someone that they've they've been paid money for a contract and they can't break the contract. So let's say they're going to work six years. They either have to work out the contract or buy themselves back out. But you can't quit. Any other job, I can quit whenever I want. But what they've done is they have taken money in advance to, to be an Eved. And this Eved is treated well. The master, if the master can't say, I've got a pillow, only one pillow, so I'm going to use it, not the Eved. If you only got one, you give it to the Eved. You know, uh, whatever food the master eats, the boss, the Eved, he has to give the Eved. He can't give low quality food, right? So it's, it's certainly not what we call a slave generally in English. But because this Evan has certain obligations to his boss, he's exempt from certain mitzvahs. So, Rabbi? Um, the, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Is this for an, an, an Evan Ivrit? Yeah, we're talking about an Evan Ivrit, yeah. We're talking about a Jewish Evan. Um, in this case. So, even, even the Evan Kanani, the, the non Jewish Evan, will say he's half a Jew. What happens if he becomes half a Jew? 
And so he has certain mitzvahs. And yeah, so the blessing really is with Evid Kanani. I was just explaining the concept of Evid. So, but he has certain mitzvahs, and but not all the mitzvahs. So he has more mitzvahs than a non Jew, but less than a regular Jew. So therefore, then we thank Hashem that we're not an Evid, because then we have extra mitzvahs. Then what happens is men have a third blessing that they sh thank Hashem that they're, they're not a lady in that because men have the extra mitzvahs of tefillin and various things. And so they thank, thank Hashem for those mitzvahs. So that's a third blessing for the men. The women have a different third blessing. They say, that Hashem made me like he wanted in the first place. In other words, whatever the men, the level they achieve through doing, put on to fill in those extra mitzvahs, the women were created like that on that level to start with. And uh, so that's that's so that's that's a blessing. That's that's different. That's really the only part that's different. There are some communities that, for example, in the Moida Ani, so I guess you know, Hebrew has uh, masculine versions of words and feminine versions. So some people say Moida Ani. So it's just a feminine version of the words. There's a few words like that in the Davani. Most people don't, you know, this is the set text and that's what they say and it's about the Jewish people as a whole, so we're not worried about um, the masculine and feminine. But there could be, some communities do have some minor differences, a few words, just the grammatical, so they'll say the same words, but the vowels will change slightly for the grammatical reasons. But uh, the only difference really is that blessing. Um, so that's, that's, in general, the Davani is the same. I'll add one more point to that. And that is um, many, many women, particularly. So the reason, you know, when it, when a child is born, it requires the mother much more than the father. Right? You know, they tell the joke. You know, uh, I don't want to sleep like a baby at night. I want to sleep like my husband. You know. Not that I have as a husband. Don't get don't don't get me wrong. But you know that's 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 what they say, right? Because it's the mother nurses the baby and and uh, various things. So the even when it doesn't necessarily need the mother per se, the reality is little kids. It's they're nurtured far more by the by their mother. You know that's it's. it's uh, that's so why, thank God, my kids turned out okay because they got such a good mother. You know, would have relied on me. Who knows what they'd be like? But you know, that's uh, <laughs> that's 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 a baruch Hashem. So what happens is because of that, um, often women daven less, or well, they don't do the whole whole uh, thing when they have children. They'll say the more basic parts and various things. So sometimes it's uh, it's a difference in that, and perhaps they won't always go to shul. Because, you know, the, with the kids at home, and but in concept, the davening's the same. Thank you, Rabbi. No problems. Okay, so, um, that's a pretty blessing. Also mentioned, you know, what we said here is the Ashkenazic uh, custom. Many Sephardic communities, it's not the chazan who says the priestly blessing. They actually. Um, the priests get up and bless. So in Ashkenazim, we only do it on Yontav. On a Yontav, on a joyous day. Um, by Sfarim, outside of Israel, generally it's every Shabbos. And in Israel, every day of the week. Um, so that's... We have it. No, anyway, Rabbi, Sfarim also do it during the week. Outside of it, you said. As well? Yes. Okay, so there must be different customs amongst the five themselves. But uh yeah, okay. So we're we we well I get to learn something today as well. <laughs> oh, Hashem. All right, looks like we ran out of time. So I wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful week. You too, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Take care, everybody. We'll see everyone Thank next week, everybody. Everybody. Thank you, Rabbi, for the show. Take care. For the show. Have a good wonderful month. Yeah.